Uh, welcome everyone to the spring 2015 final presentations and completion ceremony for uh, the Asian Social Justice Internship. This is one of the programs of which we are most proud here at the Kupferberg Holocaust Center. It involves one of our core missions, which is using the lessons of the Holocaust to combat unbridled prejudice, hat hatred, and bigotry wherever it exists. And teaching and facilitating the learning of the experience, especially of Korean comfort women, Korean sexual slaves during World War II, is a great example of living that mission. Where we have the experience from the Holocaust, we have years of research of listening to survivors, of shaping our understanding of the past through their voices and their memories and their experiences, coupling that with the, holo with the historical materials, the photographs, the documents, the archives, the resources. And we have a great deal of experience from the Holocaust over these last several decades when it's gotten a great deal of intense focus of learning how to teach students, how to reach them, how to share uh, a history that is far away in the past, both geographically and temporally, from the experience that our students here have today. And as you will hear from the presentations, this history has reached these students. They have taken in bits of the horrors and atrocities of the past. And what's essential is that it hasn't paralyzed them. The purpose of teaching the Holocaust is not to stop at the moment of horror and remain stuck in place, but to try to figure out how, in your own life, through your own decisions and through your own actions, you can learn from that past. That knowledge shapes who you are today, and that understanding informs every decision you make out in the world. So we are very proud of these interns who have taken their time for a course that gives them no credit, but they've taken the time over this past semester to focus and dedicate themselves to an experience which is quite unique within colleges and universities we feel across the country. And so I want to welcome the students and thank them for all their work over this semester. And of course, we look forward to hearing from you shortly. I just wanted to share a couple thoughts in prefacing this that mostly come from the experience and the questions of the Holocaust community that this institution was founded to serve. And generally, survivors and their descendants might ask what is the reason that a Holocaust Resource Center will focus on the comfort women issue? Certainly it's an important issue, but it doesn't fall within the scope of the Holocaust. Why should you be addressing it? So there are a few reasons. The first one that I want to mention is that sexual violence, we are coming to understand, is at the core of almost every act of genocide and every mass atrocity in the history of the world, I will venture to guess. I don't have the evidence on that, but certainly the mass atrocities we saw in the 20th and early 21st century, as you can see by these newspaper headlines, the top of which about the Muslim Ro Rohingya, those of you who have been following the news, this is happening right now. And this top headline, is dated June 2nd. So this has happened just is that earlier this week, a couple days ago. I'll give you a second to look through the different headlines, but I want to focus your attention on the bottom comment from Major General Patrick Kamerd, former UN peacekeeping commando, commander, where he says, and this is a quote, it is now more dangerous to be a woman than a soldier in modern conflicts. So the importance of this issue didn't, doesn't get folded up neatly and tucked into our 1930s folder, but the, the questions we're raising 
and the issues we're grappling with are very contemporary. Secondly, and this is important to know, although not often discussed in the case of the Holocaust, for a variety of reasons we might discuss today why sexual violence tends not to be widely reported by the victims, their families, or their communities. But just an example of the prevalence of sexual violence during the Holocaust, I, we did a research project on one particular archive of survivor testimonies from the Holocaust, and that's the largest, the one held by the USC Shoah Foundation. That collection has nearly 52,000 audiovisual interviews with survivors of the Holocaust taken around the world. Out of those 52,000 testimonies, 2,800 mentioned sexual violence. That's 5%. So out of a massive archive chronicling innumerable different types of Holocaust experiences, five out of every 100 mentioned sexual violence. And when you think about how difficult it is to talk about and how most survivors and their families tend to silence these issues, you understand that if you have five out of 100 more than likely there are 25 who could have spoken about it but chose not to. So five is a huge number. We did an even more focused study just looking at those testimonies that mention the concentration camps because there's discussions of sexual violence in ghettos, in cities, in camps, in concentration camps, in displaced persons camps. So we said let's just look at one small subset. It's not that small, it's half the archive, about 25,000 testimonies. So these are people already in concentration camps where life is very, very controlled. Um, although if we think about current research that's coming out about the US prison system and the prevalence of sexual violence there, you start to see that even within very controlled environments, sexual violence occurs as well. So out of the concentration camp testimonies, 263 of them in 16 different languages describe camp sexual assaults. And I put a little chart up here to show you the breakdown of not all of those victims, not all of those testimonies are describing their own victimization. 37% of those incidents are describing someone else's sexual assault. 16% of them were, women, were witnesses of sexual assault. And 19 um, were victims of attempted sexual assault, but not the assault itself. Now, why emphasize these differing groups who speak about sexual assault? To demonstrate as clearly as possible that sexual assault clearly impacts people far beyond the victims themselves. This chart doesn't even include the impact that this knowledge had on the families of these women, mostly women, not exclusively, um, on their children, um, or the children they could never later have? And what kind of impact does that have on a culture and on a society? So sexual violence, the Holocaust, far from being outside of this image, the Holocaust was a major, major uh, piece of the puzzle in helping us to understand the prevalence of sexual assault in almost every incidence of mass atrocity. In fact, it's been speculated that we could use sexual assault or rape as an indicator that a particular region might be on the borderlines of genocide. That is that the prevalence of rape indicates a certain state of exception, a society that has shifted away from the traditionally accepted mores and ethics of our shared cultures. Um, this is just to demonstrate the prevalence of sexual assault at various camps during the Holocaust. It's interesting, although not essential for these purposes, to note the different people who were the perpetrators of sexual assault in these cases, that it was not just, but it was very largely the Nazis themselves, but also um, other fellow prisoners. So that's a very sad, and we won't explore it in this context, but we could at some point. So for the audience, what questions should we ask? This is my list for you, that I hope you walk away having a sense of all of these, the answers to all of these questions. 
And if you don't get answers, I hope you ask questions at the end to get them. I just want to give some thanks to the people who have helped make this program possible, not just this semester, but historically. Um, first of all, we wanted to thank the city council members who help us fund this project, Peter Koo, Dan Drum, and Rory Lansman, and also assembly members Ron Kim and Ed Bronstein. We have a staffer today from Assemblyman Bronstein's office, Ms. Amber Yoon, who has brought um, special uh, merit certificates for each of the student participants signed by the assemblyman. Of course, we want to thank the Korean American Civic Empowerment Group, represented today by CJ Park, um, and our instructor, not the first time, um, Dr. Jimin Kim, who does an amazing job in leading this program and educating these students and in working with them. Uh, so I'd like to recognize um, Mr. C.J. Park and give him a chance to make some opening comments. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lesson. And yeah, uh, my name is Chejin Park. I'm staff of 24 uh, Korean American Civic Empowerment. We are co-sponsoring this program. And uh, most of all, I want to thank you, all the students who participated in this wonderful program. And uh, we are expecting you to do something for this. You know, I mean, you, you spend your time for this program, but we want you to become an ambassador for the Comfort Woman survivors. Last week, one more Comfort Woman survivor passed away last week. And and as you can, you know, you saw them, you interviewed the survivors uh, during this program, right? And then they are really old, as you can see, you know, they, even they cannot, they, it's really hard to communicate with them now. Uh, but still, they are waiting for their, I mean, uh, apology they deserve. And, and when we, uh, start this program, I explained about that uh, Prime Minister Abe is uh, visiting the United States and he is trying to deliver the joint session speech at the Congress. Yeah, he did, he did. And then we expected, I went to Harvard University to protest him and then we sent someone in Washington DC and then sent someone in, in, in California and then what he said, you know, the students always, the people ask him, even when they had, when Prime Minister Abe and uh, President Obama had a joint press conference, the first question was about comfort woman. And the, the answer was all the same. He always said the same way that he felt sometimes in some kind of a heartache or something, and he just feel uncomfortable, but they were saying something else, you know, he was blaming um, someone else. And so that was not uh, we have been waiting for. You know, right? That is not uh, the thing we ask them. And the uh, comfort home survivors, you know, have been waiting for the real apology, unequivocal apology from the government who is responsible for that, uh, that atrocity. So we need your testimony, and we need you, even though you, are, you used the uh, internet, the, some technology, but you personally interviewed them, and then you know that it really happened, and then please you know, you spread your testimony, I mean your experience with uh, comfort women survivors. Maybe next year, maybe two or three years after, you may not conduct that interview anymore because every year, in a, just in this year, four comfort woman survivors passed away. So only in this year, it's, you know, we, we are not sure how many more uh, survivors will um, pass away this year. But your, that the interview is really, really precious for the history remain, you know, we wanted to keep uh, doing this, and then you, we want you 
become real ambassador for them uh, for in, in the United States. Maybe we are trying to invite a uh, comfort Thomas survivor this summer. Uh, maybe we can do something together. Maybe you can meet, uh, personally meet one of the comfort Thomas survivor you interviewed. Um, we are trying to do that in the, in, during the summer. You know, I hope you, know, you become, uh, you participate in that program we may it's not you know set yet, but we are still discussing about the program. Maybe we can talk with uh, Dr. Lesh, Neshem. But um, so maybe, yeah. Uh, I want to wrap it up. So I'm congratulate. I mean, congratulations, to your students, and then thank you for participating in this. And please keep this experience to spread this your experience to your friend, your uh, family members, and. Any, anybody you know you can outreach. Thank you. I'd like to invite Dr. Jimin Kim to take over this. Um, thank you for coming to the final uh, presentation of 2015 Asian Social Justice in Internship Program ceremony. Um, in this semester, we have 10 students interns and uh, who successfully completed this program. And I'm very proud of them um, who dedicated, who had lively discussion on every Wednesday, and who dedicated to this issue, and who um, who became very knowledgeable about war crimes, compared women issue, and current issues to related to these, those issues. Um, as the highlight of the program, they had a chance to talk to survivors who really went through this tragedy. And we found that those survivors are very strong women who survived this tragedy and also who came forward to tell their stories to these young students so that the history doesn't make the same mistake in the future. Um, after our discussions and interview, uh, my students be determined to become their dele delegates for the s survivors. So after the interview, they decided to work on projects, action plans to um, let other people know about this issue too, and uh, to help those survivors restore their, their dignity and uh, to receive official apology from the Japanese government. Uh, so I'm glad and thank my students that uh, I could see how those students have grown, not only as students, but also as members of uh, responsible members of human society. So without further delay, I'd like to invite my students to the stage and tell their stories themselves. So uh, we have three groups. <laughs> so first group uh, interviewed with Oksan Lee at the House of Sharing in Korea, residents of uh, Kompo, former Kompere women and they are Nancy Aparcio, Farzana Siddiq, and Carolina Cav uh, Gavalia. <laughs> and they interviewed with Oksan Lee. She was born in 1927 in Busan, and she was abducted in 1942, and she was sent to convert station in China. So I will ask each of you about your experience of this program and the interview and uh, ask you to present your uh, individual project. Uh, Nancy, could you start? How was the, the interview and how, what was your thought? For me, this was an en enriching experience because when I first started the interview, the internship, I had no idea. I had no knowledge about comfort women and their history. But as, as the inter, um, internship went on, I could understand how we, newer, genera 
newer generations are important because we are the ones who are, we are the future. And we are the ones who are gonna change, who are gonna change. lead the world and like, lead the world and um, prevent this kind of tragedies from happening again. So I think it's very important to spread awareness. I could now understand why. And so I think it's important to spread awareness about this type of tragedies so they never happen again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nancy wrote a poem and... I wrote a poem like for the for comfort women. The one who would the one who wouldn't be defeated. You're you are an example of prefer pers perseverance. Perseverance. How violent how courageous, sorry. How violent, how courageous, how wonderful it is that you are that you can stand among us today and you and share with us your struggle so that we may all partake in your pain in the hopes that some would be lifted from your soul. How wonderful it is that you are here to teach us about a life we will never come to know, but that would help us leave the one, live the one we, we are living in today. You are a delicate flower who refuses to be crushed under the foot, the foot of your oppressor. How wonderful it is that you are here so that we may laugh and cry with you. You are the voice of those who, couldn't, who could not speak. You who was shamed, violated, but not defeated. You that is stronger than most has showed, has showed us how wonderful it is to have you. Thank you. Farzana, uh, the same question. What was the most impressive part of your interview? Um, what was the most impressive? Um, the interview in its entirety was was great. I enjoyed. I had a rudimentary understanding of the comfort woman issue. Um, I only learned about it a few years ago when my sister was taking a history class, and it was a rape on non King. And uh, after that, I wanted to learn more, but I didn't take that initiative. But when I found out about the internship, I decided I should take this opportunity to learn more and to even have the chance to actually speak to an actual survivor. So um, when I was doing the interview, um, it was very, like she said, it was enriching. And I should move it closer. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, so um, what was I saying? <laughs> it was oh wow that's loud. <laughs> uh, I I really enjoyed it and it it gave me a better understanding and a more of a wider perspective on this certain issue. It actually um, made me feel more grateful for the life that I had and for the protectors that I have because these girls were snatched straight off the street and they were deceived into thinking they would have education, when really they were just being taken to a, a conversation where their innocence was just taken away from them. So it made me feel more grateful and more humble that I have a great life and I shouldn't take it for granted. So that was great. Farshana, uh, could you explain your drawing? It's not <laughs> It's a mixed media piece, uh, graphite, ink, and color pencil. I don't know if you can see it. Um, I did an image of my idea of a couple woman. So she's, I, I know you can't really tell, but she's elderly in her face. But um, she has her eyes and her mouth covered. And there's a representative, representative of the Japanese government saying that they fabricated their stories, that it was all a lie, and that's just trying to keep them silent. But despite all of that, she still is a young child at heart, and she's letting her story be known, and it's coming out of her in different ways. Um, also, she's holding a lotus flower, and um, 
I just I, I see them come from them as lotus flowers because if anything, if you know about lotus flowers, they grow in muddy water, and despite yeah, they grow in like really murky water. So despite that, they still able to bloom and grow. And in Buddhism, uh, lotus flowers are known to purify. So in that in some sense, they are purified and they're blooming as beautiful flowers. Okay. Thank you. Carolina, uh, uh, what is your thoughts after this program and the interview? Um, all right, at first, when I started the internship, I didn't know anything at all about Comfort Women. And um, after interviewing them, I thought it was really a shame that they're never in any history textbooks or talked about at all, while we talk so much about the Holocaust, about a lot of other things, and we never learn anything about them at all and they're dying out. So after interviewing them, I thought it was really important that we share their stories because we can't just let the Japanese government wipe them under a rug. And I think they owe, like, I think they need an apology from the Japanese government and also from everyone that just doesn't recognize them, like history textbooks, history professors that never talk about them. Us, we never make a big deal about it and we're supposed to be you know, like a leading country, um, and yeah. And okay. what was your project about? Um, I made a collage, and that was my survivor that I interviewed. And um, what really affected me was that she told us that when she, when they, when the war ended, and she went to the house of sharing, that she like met up with her sisters, and they rejected her because they were ashamed of her. And I thought that was so sad that her own family rejected her. So I made a collage with flowers and pictures of her just to remind her that she's still beautiful even though they even though they made her feel ashamed of something that she had no control over. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. So thank you. I will invite the second group who interviewed with Hina Miu. And Hina Miu was born in 1929, and she was abducted in And Hinam Yu was sent to a uh, comfort station in Osaka, Japan. Oscar Fajardo, Angelica Harcharan, and Malaysia Rice interviewed with Hinam Yu. Um, Oscar, uh, what was your experience of this program? Um, well, to be honest about this, I didn't had I had no idea about this um, problem. I knew the Japanese um, were like me, and they were taking control over other countries. But I didn't know about anything about comfort women, how they were treated, and how they were affected. Um, what got me most like sad it was when I interviewed my um, my survivor. my survivor, <laughs> and she said that when she was um, when that war ended, she went to this housing, and then. No, she went to this place to live, and then she married and got sons, and her, she had a daughter too. And then when she t decided to tell tell them about this problem, they rejected her. They like just turned their backs on her. And it was really sad, and it really got into me. So I think we can make a change. It's not only about just getting their apology, but I think this will help prevent uh, from this happening over again. Okay. And could you explain about your project? Um, I made my a website where people can donate if uh, so we can help these people. And that's the website. Um, it's not like it's not being paid and it's just created so it doesn't have like much views right now. But I 
put the Holocaust Center as the place where they can donate. And I put a little description of uh, what's come from women and what's going on. And I put that our mission is to spread the voice and to let, like, get the apologies they need. Thank you. Malaysia, could you tell us about your, your experience? My experience, like, it moved me a lot because I didn't know nothing about, like, the holo I mean, about the Asian comfort women. So when I interviewed um, my survivor, like, when she was telling me about, um, like, how um, she found out she had lung cancer, that's how she had to go into the house of sharing, and then that's how she had to open up to her um, children about how she was raped in World War II. Like, it really moved me and how they just denied her like, because they don't want nothing to do with her because they, she they're ashamed of her. But I feel that she have no control over that, so you shouldn't, like, take blame out on her. But I just really got into it. And could you explain about your project? A project with um, Angelica? I did a poem. So um, the poem is, um, He Nam Yo, 16 years ago, He Nam Yo, 16 years ago, Korean heritage. Um, 16 years, 16 years old, Korean her heritage. Only was in the fifth grade when captured by the Japanese savages. The women with her innocence taken, forced to serve m many men in one day, with the Japanese government not thinking twice about having her mistaken. The women who was given a second chance at life. Being tortured, beaten, and nearly killed, but fought like a survivor, she is to have an afterlife. The women who constantly have to stay her past just to make the world believe how cruel the Japanese were to Korean women, but it's not an easy task. Now a mother of two, a daughter and a son who refuses to communicate with her after knowing what happened back in World War II. She's a survivor, a believer, and an Asian comfort woman who needs closure. She's been through more than enough. She's just human. Okay, great job. Angelica, could you share your experience? Okay, hi everyone. The same thing that Oscar and Malaysia said about not having much uh, knowledge about comfort women. Um, I felt the same way when I start when I first started the in uh, internship. After completing the internship, uh, I gained a lot more knowledge of comfort women, and um, it was an amazing experience. So. And the project, uh, the poster board that I did was a uh, collage, and uh, in the front were the pictures of Oscar and Malaysia because we interviewed the same. And then in the back was just pictures of Comfort Woman and um, some words power, justice, faith, hope, and just being active about the issue. So. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I will invite the last group. Jody and Karina and uh, Shovan and Shashi. Shashi couldn't attend today. Uh, they interviewed with survivors at the uh, Lila Pilipina Center in the Philippines. And it was our first time to interview with the Filipino uh, survivors. The first survivor was Hiralia Bastanmate, and she was born in 1930, and she was abducted in 1943. And the second one was Esteli Tadai, and she was born in 1930, and uh, she was abducted in 1944. Uh, as this was our first experience of interviewing um, Filipino survivors, I'd like to show you a video clip from this interview. Uh, please uh, describe how you were taking to the comfort station. So while on the highway going to her village, one truckload of soldiers came, and then they they captured Lola, and then she was uh, two soldiers hold her in hands, 
and then she is trying to resist. But the more she resists, she receives some violence from the Japanese troops. She was, uh, she was, ano yun? Sinang pala po, sinito. So, the Japanese soldiers uh, slapped her in the face several times. And she was, uh, they were holding her hands and then they boxed her in the stomach. So sometimes she felt that she lost consciousness, but she can still say that two Japanese soldiers hold her hands and then the uh, other Japanese soldier uh, hold her feet and then they just throw her inside the truck. She was brought, when she was abducted by the Japanese troops, she was brought to a garrison or the camp of the Japanese. And then they were confined in the rooms and they cannot go out because there are some guards and they were forbidden to talk to themselves and other uh, women victims. And they were washing the clothes and then they were cooking food for the Japanese. And at night, so many Japanese soldiers will come to the camp and then rape them. One or two come also and then she begin to resist because she felt pain in her body. So she is resisting. And then the Japanese soldier was so angry. And then the Japanese soldier hold her in her head and push her in, in the table. So she bumped her head very hard. And then she lost her consciousness. And then when she regained back her consciousness, one woman told her, given, gave her, her, her advice that next time do not resist just give them what they want because um, something may happen to you i am calling Sienso abe as a liar he said there is no evidence of force but we are the living witness that we were forced so we have three demands from the Japanese. First, public apology from the Japanese government. Second is historical inclusion of the Japanese military sexual slavery. And the third is compensation. Okay, um, Jodian, could you share your thoughts after this interview? How was the program and how was the interview? I find the program to be very educational. I didn't have any idea about um, the comfort women as many of my other colleagues didn't. Um, I also found it um, sad the way these women were treated and they could have been any one of us. You know, they could have been any of our family members um, any of our relatives, just that it was in a different location and at a different time. So. Um. What was your project about? My, okay, so I, I did something intentionally for it to be like a flyer of a missing person. However, this person was a missing voice. And it says, she could be your mother. She could be your nan, meaning grandmother. She has no voice. She has no choice, and the clock is ticking. Tick tock, tick tock. Her silence can be our voice. Her silence can be our choices today. She is brave. After hearing her story, are you? Stand up for what is right and be her light. It is time they own up to their wrong. It is time they say sorry. Thank you. And uh, what is your plan with this flyer? Are you? Um, I intend to share it along um, campus, or at least to a flyer, because the the closest 
um, audience that I have to me right now is the school campus, also social media. Um, I could also work along with any of my other colleagues that um, are interested in, uh, you know, collaborating. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Karina? Um, my, okay, it's, it's going to be the same like almost everybody who, who were, who was in the internship. I didn't know anything about Comfort Women, but when I heard about it, when we start watching videos about it, I got impacted emotionally because I started thinking about, you know, my family, my younger, um, yeah, my younger, my younger cousins who are who's who's their age. The woman, like thir in the 13 14. 13, 14 years old, being kidnapped, and it just hurt me really bad. So I'm really happy that I was um, given this opportunity to learn more about the Comfort Woman. And could you explain about your project? Um, so I did a flyer in a way to represent the two survivors, Philippine, Philippine, Philippines, right? The Philippine, sorry, <laughs> Philippine survivors. Um, I did a way um, to, uh, I'm sorry, I'm nervous. Uh, I said that how um, to help spread the news, this is one way to spread the news. And I also added the Holocaust Center um, address address to help people know more about it. And another student in this group, Shashi Ahmed, uh, could not attend today, but she uh, worked on this drawing. Uh, she explained that uh, this person is a, a Filipino survivor she interviewed with, and she is uh, wrapped by a Philippine, uh, Filipino uh, national flag. And one hand is trying to harass her, but another hand is resisting. The, the violence. Yeah. <laughs> and Shoban, uh, uh, what was your experience like? Uh, oh, well, to be honest, I couldn't make it to the interview with the Comfort Women, but I have watched several videos and I heard reactions from my colleagues how these women have felt and how their reaction was afterwards. I have the same words as them, so I, I don't want to repeat myself, but one thing I would like to mention is that, that we like to, to blame the, the incident on the Japanese soldiers, but we, have, we do have to understand that these soldiers were governed by the government. They were put on pressure. I'm sure if we were put on pressure, we would have reacted the same way. So it's more of a Japanese government fault than the soldiers, I would say. And one thing I also watched in the video, that she provided to me to watch that these women were also drugged with opium so they could continue their activity with the uh, with the soldiers and keep on going for days and days and hours so that's just ridiculous to me so i would say and i also created a facebook page i put on some information about these women i think i got like five six likes so far it's, it's going on though. And I shared a video that she provided to me. So, because I, I figured that people don't like reading much and they like it if I provide it with a video. So I put on a video and I hope more, more people learns about it and shares with others so we could keep this going and let others know about this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Shoban, Karina, and Jodian. What's the group called? So you know, oh, okay. Yeah. Page, the Facebook page. Oh. Is that? Uh, it could go on um, facebook.com slash support comfort women and oh. you'll find the pages. There's a video underneath. You can watch that. You guys right there. Mm -hmm. The first one. It looks great. I created last night, so you know, it's still going <laughs> on. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And so who is going to present the group project? Um, this, is the, this is the title. We put on who are the couple women as the caption, as a title, so it catches attention. Um, these are some pictures we provided. These are the reactions, how we felt from these 
students, and this is a quote that we got. I would like to say is, I have forgiven the Jap for Japanese what they did to me, but I can never forget. The war never ended for the Congo women. And these are some of the reactions. These are the group pictures. You guys like to talk about your reaction from here, or what do you guys? Only Oscar, mm -hmm. only Oscar is, is Carolina, Oscar and Mike. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah